In 2016, the average age of an MLB player was 28.6 years old, which makes sense since that's the intersection between physical prowess and mental maturity for most athletes. And then there was Bartolo Colon on the eve of his 43rd birthday, who went into spring training in Port St. Lucie for the Mets. He just signed a one-year deal with New York that would pay him $7.25 million, a far cry from 2008 when he played for the Boston Red Sox and earned the MLB minimum of $400,000 at the time. He was 35 years old then, with his right shoulder being basically shredded from years of overuse. In fact, by 2010, he wasn't pitching in the bigs at all. In 2011, he signed a minor league deal with the Yankees, with no promise he'd make the team. By then he was 38. It was over, right? For most formerly elite pitchers, that certainly would have been true. Once the owner of a 100 mile per hour heater and a Cy Young award, Cologne in 2016 was now throwing two seamers that couldn't shatter a pane of glass. He broke in in 1997 weighing 185 pounds of farm hardened muscle. By then he'd ballooned to 285, looking more like Paul Blart than Paul Bunyan. Yet, somehow, from the ashes of injury, steroid controversy, and an uphill battle for playing time, Cologne had been able to resurrect his career, and as the 2016 season dawned, he was now called Big Sexy, standing as arguably the most popular player on a team that had just gone to the World Series, a team that boasted young stars like Jacob deGrom, Noah Syndergaard, Steven Matz, and Zach Wheeler, a team that threatened to take the Big Apple limelight away from the Yankees. But it was as spring training began that pretty much all Mets fans in the area began to flock around Cologne disproportionate to the other players. He really had become a fan favorite. That didn't necessarily mean he had a spot. Upon arriving to spring training, he had told reporters he was taking it one year at a time, that he wasn't sure he'd be back the next season or what role he'd play that season. Regardless, nothing seemed to bother him. Baseball was a sport that brought him great joy, and he played it like he was just going out there with his friends. There were many plays to show this off, whether that was his behind the back throw to first base, his hellacious swings at the plate that would cause his helmet to fly off, or the jiggling of his gut between innings. The guy was a fun-loving character at his very core. He wasn't supposed to be a main piece of the Mets puzzle the previous year, and yet, there he was, eating up innings and helping lead the Mets into the playoffs in 2015. When New York had signed him in 2014 for two years and 20 million, fans were at best skeptical. Then he went out and gave them 396 innings over the next two seasons of serviceable pitching, at times veering into exemplary. That prior postseason, he'd won Game 4 of the NLCS against the Cubs, sending the Amazings to the World Series a year before anyone thought they were ready. In the process, he ended up becoming the oldest player to lose a World Series game, but how many players can say they made their World Series debut at the age of 42? He was a unicorn, who in 2016 broke MLB's conception of what was possible like few have ever done before. Clune did things that made history, that became part of the game's lore, that remain iconic to this day. That he was the one behind these epic escapades isn't easy to understand, because nothing about the story adds up. He wasn't Nolan Ryan, still hitting triple digits in his 40s. He wasn't Satchel Paige, ageless and elegant to his fifth decade. He was Big Bart, a Homer Simpson lookalike with a Kyle Hendricks fastball and basically no quality off-speed pitch. So, how did he do it? And what exactly did this season look like, month to month? Join us today as we break down the year Bartolo broke baseball. But before we get into that, I want to ask that if you enjoyed today's video, consider liking and subscribing and possibly even becoming a member of the channel. It's the best way to help us here at MTC to keep making the content that we do week to week. Like I always try to say with this, I can't bring a ton of value because I am doing a lot of work day to day to try to make these videos happen, but I will do my best to provide whatever I can, including members only quiz questions, live streams where you can connect on a more intimate level when it comes to talking about baseball, and early access to our essay videos. Thanks for considering, now let's get back to our video. Cologne started the season as a fill-in starter for the injured Zach Wheeler, who'd had Tommy John surgery and wasn't expected back until July 1st. The Mets weren't sure exactly what they'd get from the middle-aged man who in his first three spring training outings had posted an ERA over 10, but Big Sexy certainly had more in the tank, and in late March, he went six scoreless against the Blue Jays in one of his final tune-up outings. During this time, it also became clear that one of the things that Mets fans loved about Cologne was also his selfless attitude. They'll do whatever they want to with me, Cologne said after that game. I trust them. I just want to help the team out. All spring training, he kept the team laughing with his infectious smile and laid-back attitude, even as his own place on the team remained in flux. One of the biggest sources of joy that Cologne brought to the game with the Mets was his hitting as a National League pitcher. Prior to coming to the Mets in 2014, he'd come to bat 85 times and gotten 10 hits, good for a 118 average. Almost half of those ABs came while playing for the Montreal Expos in 2002. Fun trivia fact here, Cologne is actually the last player to play for the Expos before his retirement. When given the chance, Cologne would approach his ABs with unbridled joy. Sure, sometimes he took three straight strikes and would go sit down, or he'd take three muddy hacks and go grab some pine. In 2014, there was a lot of slow walks back to the dugout, because he hit 032. Yeah, you heard me right, 032. His average ballooned to 138 in 2015, however. Little did anyone know what would happen come 2016. 
When the season started, Cologne worked out of the pen, pitching an inning and a third scoreless in the opener. Then he went six in his first start, taking a tough 1-0 loss against the Phillies, with Ryan Howard victimizing him with his only earned run, the homer. The game time temp was 41 degrees, and Cologne pitched in short sleeves. In the sixth, he made an over-the-shoulder catch off a bunt from Freddie Galvis, but the highlight reel was just getting fired up. He won his next start against his old team, the Cleveland Indians, working into the sixth and giving up just two runs. The rest of the April, he was vintage Big Sexy. He ate up innings, going at least five in each of his four starts, and kept his team in the game the whole time, never surrendering more than three runs. But perhaps most important of all, the Mets were winning, going 15-7 and seven in the month. Cologne's leadership and work ethic were rubbing off on young players, like Jerry's Familia, who drank in every word Cologne uttered. He's always available if you have questions, about baseball, about life. Familia told the New York Times, I mean, he's 42 years old. He knows more than everybody else here. The Mets kept rolling into May, and so did Big Sexy. Cologne won his first May start against the then-hapless Braves team in dominant fashion, going eight scoreless while striking out seven. In his first 32 and two-thirds innings, he'd walked three batters. Despite throwing his two-seamer between 86 and 90 miles per hour most nights, he could put it anywhere he wanted, usually on the edges of the strike zone, with this also being the reason he gave up 33 hits during that same span. He wasn't really overpowering anybody, but it didn't really matter as he was also generating consistently weak contact and not really giving away any freebies, the ultimate job of a control pitcher. On May 7th, in a game against the Padres at Petco Field, the Mets needed a boost both practically and emotionally and Cologne provided one in a big way, a baseball history-making way. Having lost two in a row to start a West Coast swing, Cologne needed to stop the bleeding on the mound. He did that by pitching into the seventh and giving up just three runs, but nobody remembers that from the start. What will never be forgotten, what will never be equaled, was what Cologne did in the top of the second inning. With the Mets up 2-0, Cologne came up to the plate with a runner on and two outs. He'd gone hitless to start the season, no big surprise considering his prior numbers at the plate. James Shields was on the mound, a one-time ace with the game's best changeup. Shields was on the decline, headed for a 6-19 season. On the third pitch of the AB, he grooved a 90 mile per hour heater right down the center of the plate, and Cologne turned on it, crushing it over the left field wall. At 42, Cologne had become the oldest player ever to hit a Major League homer, which was one reason why Mets announcer Gary Cohen said during his call, This is one of the great moments in the history of baseball. It was the truth. It took Cologne 30 seconds to round the bases, with a mischievous grin and immediate quotes like, I can't believe I hit a home run, which was what he told former teammate Alexi Ramirez, who was at shortstop. All the Mets players left the dugout and hid in the tunnel to give Big Sexy the silent treatment, then sprang on him in celebration. Sure, this homer didn't clinch a pennant, but it did something else. It reaffirmed the pure beauty of the sport, open to all ages, body shapes, and sizes in a way that no other major sport is. And God, was it pure fun encapsulated. But baseball is also a game of failure, so even during this magical year, Bartolo would suffer some poor starts including giving up five runs to the Dodgers and then five walks to the Nationals, something he hadn't done since 2005. Worse, there were troubles brewing in his personal life. Days after becoming a baseball legend with that homer, news broke that a woman had sued him for child support, alleging that he'd fathered two children with her. The case was quickly settled, but might help explain Cologne's sudden drop in performance. Something of that magnitude can easily weigh on the mind to great detriment to one's performance on the field. He righted the ship following this, as in his last two May starts, he threw 13 innings and gave up just three runs, finishing the month with a 4-3 record and an ERA of 3.38. Solid numbers for any pitcher, let alone an assumed fifth starter. It was in June that Cologne somehow pitched like an ace, not just to fill in. In five starts, his team went 4-1, and, and by the end of June, Cologne's ERA sat under 3, at 2.86, to go along with a 6-4 record. In just one June start, did Cologne give up more than two runs, and in the one game he lost against the Braves, he went seven innings and gave up just one earned. That underscored the team's troubles at the time. The Mets weren't scoring. Captain America David Wright had again gone on the DL, and slugging first baseman Lucas Duda was hurt too. The Mets could have signed Yuli Gurriel, but passed, probably because the team ownership was in disarray financially. The state of crisis showed in large part why the Mets needed new owners, but that wouldn't come yet for multiple years, and even since the change, the results have been, well, let's say mixed. But back to Big Bart. Two of Cologne's losses on the season had come in games where he went deep and gave up just a single run. He could have been 8-2 with the far above average ERA and considerable innings totals, incredible numbers for someone who'd turned 43 in May. However, his entire season could have been sunk on June 21st in a game against the Royals in a rematch of the 2015 World Series. In the bottom of the first, facing leadoff hitter Whit Merrifield, Cologne took a comebacker off his right thumb, subsequently having to leave the game. Fears were that his thumb was broken, and if so, he'd be out at least a month, possibly more. But Cologne being Cologne, x-rays came back negative and he didn't miss even a single start. 
he came back strong again against the Braves, giving up a run over seven innings and again taking a tough loss. Ironically, the Braves would end up signing him the next season in 2017, with him pitching more than a few innings in a brand new Truist Field. In 1997, he pitched in Turner Field when it had just opened. Insane stuff. But Cologne wasn't done making history in 2016 yet either, let alone the next year. Making an all-star team. It doesn't matter where you are on your baseball journey, getting picked to play in a game of the best against the best is always a great honor. This is true for 10-year-olds, and it's definitely true for grown men of 43. Heading into the Summer Classic, Cologne was having a strong year, sitting at 7-4 with an ERA of 3.28 which is somewhat misleading, because he'd started the month of July with a tidy mark of 2.87. But then he ran into a buzzsaw named the Washington Nationals, led by reigning NL MVP Bryce Harper. Over the previous two weeks, the Nats had played the Mets seven times and beat them six, outscoring them 39-19. In Cologne's start, he gave up six runs in four-plus innings, including homers to Harper and Anthony Rendon. Thankfully, it didn't matter. Giant starter Madison Bumgarner had pitched on the Sunday before the game, so Cologne was named as his replacement by his own manager Terry Collins, joining teammates Ioannis Cespedes, Noah Syndergaard, and Jay Reese Familia at the contest. Collins joked that he was surprised that Cologne didn't ask to rest. Cologne's reaction was typically humble. I was surprised a little bit. There are definitely better players ahead of me, but I thank God I was chosen nonetheless. What made Cologne's selection so poignant is that he'd been picked as an all-star in the 1990s, the 2000s, and the 2010s, three decades worth of all-starness. The only recent all-star who had been as old as Cologne when he'd been selected was Mariano Rivera, which is pretty good company to keep. But Mo had never signed a minor league contract between all-star appearances like Cologne had, making his selection even more unlikely. Cologne didn't end up making an appearance in-game, but he'd made his impact nonetheless. After the game, Cologne almost immediately pitched one of his best games of the year, lasting seven innings against the Cards to salvage a split and a doubleheader against a team that they were battling for a playoff spot. He struck out eight and gave up just one run while walking none. After the game, Collins asked his war horse if he could pitch on three days rest if they needed him. Cologne said sure. The results weren't pretty, as Cologne took a tough loss versus the Rockies to drop to nine and six on the year. He coughed up five runs over five innings. Despite the All-Star selection and a couple of those notable highlights, that had been his third rough start in July. With August approaching, it was time to wonder, was age finally catching up to Big Sexy? If there were any real doubts of this, Cologne quickly swept them all away. His August numbers were simply amazing. He started six games, and the Mets won four of them. In five of the six starts, Cologne pitched in the seventh inning and gave up two runs or fewer, crucial for saving a bullpen in the dog days of summer. He walked exactly six in those appearances, while fanning 24, an elite 4-1 ratio. Upon defeating the Yankees during one of these games, Cologne became the first pitcher to beat both teams in the Subway Series, as he had pitched for the Yankees for a season back in 2011, getting a win over the Mets then. He was big tonight, Terry Collins said at the start. I thought he had perhaps his best stuff all year. But Cologne wasn't done with the record books. On August 15th, during that tough loss against the D-backs, Cologne had drawn a walk. It came after 281 plate appearances without one, which remains an MLB record to this day, and will furthermore with the abolition of pitchers hitting. He also holds the record for most plate appearances with just one walk, because Cologne never walked again. What was perhaps the most surprising about it was the fact that Cologne had no intention of swinging, period, because his left wrist had been bothering him. On the AB, Bart said, The pitcher didn't strike me out because he didn't want to. I couldn't make a swing because of my hand. If you're keeping score, that's two hitting records for a 43-year-old pitcher. As the calendar reached September, the Mets were in the thick of a pennant race. This is when clutch players step up, and Cologne did just that. In his first September start against the Reds, he went six innings and gave up no runs. Two starts later, he did it again against the Twins, but this time he managed to last seven innings. He won both games, with his record now standing at 14-7, a 667 winning percentage. Couple that with a low threes ERA and an around 120 ERA plus, and you had numbers that usually belonged to a one or two starter, not a five guy. Clone was the rock on a team with Thor, DeGrom, Matt Harvey, and Steven Matz. He might not have been the flashiest of the bunch, but he was their stopper regardless. The man who wanted the ball no matter what, and would give quality outing after quality outing. Well, except for maybe one start in September. That came against the Marlins in Miami, the first game either team played following the death of Jose Fernandez the prior Sunday. The grief was still very raw for both teams, as the Marlins players all wore number 16 to salute their fallen comrade. In the bottom of the first, Cologne had to pitch. With D. Gordon batting, Cologne served up a meatball right down the middle, with Gordon hitting his first homer and 300 at-bats. The tears immediately started to flow, on both teams. It was a gracious gesture on Cologne's part, and went to show part of the reason he was so respected league-wide. After this, Cologne proceeded to have the worst start of his season. In two and two-thirds innings, he gave up eight hits and seven runs. His ERA jumped from 312 to 342. His own homer earlier in the year had been one of the most fun in MLB history, 
with the one he gave up in the start perhaps being one of the saddest as well. His post-game comments captured his feelings pretty well. I feel like it was great for them that they were able to win. You know what though? I would have really enjoyed it if it was Fernandez who got the win over me. But Cologne came back in his next start on October 1st and pitched his team into the postseason, beating the Phillies for his 15th win of the year, giving up two runs in five innings. On a team loaded with huge arms, it was the old man who couldn't throw 90 who led the way right until the very end. Sadly for the Mets, this would pretty much be the end of their year, as they'd lose 3 0 in the wildcard game versus the Giants. It's often said that athletes die twice, once when their career ends, and then once when they depart our earthly domain. But not big Bartolo Colon. Because he extended his career for as long as he did, he gained a kind of second life as an athlete. He should have been done in 2008 when his shoulder came apart. He didn't pitch at all in 2010. He signed a minor league deal in 2011. The Grim Reaper was knocking on his door consistently. But as they also say, a rolling stone gathers no moss. Bart kept grinding, reinventing himself as a control finesse pitcher even as the game was overtaken by freaks of nature, who were 6 inches taller, 100 pounds lighter, and a decade younger. Following his magical run in 2016, Cologne signed with the Braves for $12 million. That was released on July 4th after posting an ERA over 8. He was picked up by the Twins, where he fared slightly better, going 5-6 with an ERA of 518. Between the two teams, he ate up 143 innings at the age of 44. He signed with the Rangers in 2018, and in one of his first starts, he took a perfect game through seven, at 45 years old. He gobbled up another 146 innings, again with an ERA over five, but he won seven more games in the process, giving him 247 for his career, 51st all time, and the most for any Latino pitcher ever. He wouldn't end up officially retiring from Major League Baseball until 2023. The Rolling Stone kept rolling, opting to pitch in Mexico and then the Dominican Winter League, when he threw out the first pitch at Citi Field on May 7th last season to honor the 7th anniversary of his fabled homer. He technically hadn't retired. That didn't come until September. But perhaps that still isn't the end of his story. Cologne recently got drafted by the Monarchs of Baseball United in Dubai, and in his first game, as a 50-year-old, he went three innings and gave up two runs. Against all odds, Big Sexy is still around in some capacity, eating up innings wherever they're given to him, and I don't suspect he'll stop anytime soon. Now, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed today's video, remember to like, subscribe, and consider joining the channel as a member. You can click this playlist for other essay content just like this. Now, have a great rest of your day.